want, uh, you can write down your question on a sheet of paper. Hopefully we still have some left uh, and put it in the box. Uh, these are the <laughs> questions we have so far, plus some questions that will uh, pass around the microphone and allow you to ask as well. Uh, but if you're bashful and don't want to you know, ask the question, you're, you're sure, surely welcome to write it down, uh, place it in the box. I'll grab them before we come up. And uh, I hope you brought a sack breakfast. <laughs> we might be here. No, I don't know. We won't be here that long. Maybe 2 a.m. or so. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. Why don't we pray? Ask the Lord's blessing on our time tonight. Father, thank you so much. How could we possibly thank you enough for who you are, for how you are, for how good you are to us? We want to commit our time to you tonight, Lord. We want to ask your blessing on it. We want to invite you to be here to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Lord, we want to worship you. We want all that takes place in this place to be pleasing to you. Of course, we want to ask your blessing on our time, but we also want to be a blessing to you. So as we worship now, Lord, will you receive from our hearts to yours? In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I'm talking about right there. I think you guys are as excited as I am and looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Well, I want to share with you uh, a couple things. I met Don uh, back in the early 90s and actually went to Israel with Don in uh, 1994. Uh, and I just, I was thinking about this and just remembered that I got detained at the airport in Tel Aviv then too. Uh, but since it was before 9-11, uh, I was only detained for about 15 minutes until dawn. I don't know what you said to them, but you said something, and they let me go without a uh, strip search, for which I was extremely grateful. So anyway, thank you, Don, by the way, if I didn't uh, thank you back then. Don's a good friend of mine, and uh, of course, the Bible answer man, as far as I'm concerned. And when I learned in June at the pastor's conference in California that he was going to be here, for How to Walk and for the uh, Pastors Conference and the End Times Outreach. Uh, I tried to, you know, plug him in as, as much as I could. Of course, I had to compete with Waxer Tipton of One Love Ministries and Pastor Bill Stonebreaker at Calvary Chapel Honolulu. You might say I played like fourth fiddle. <laughs> my argument of, hey, Don's my friend, didn't work. They still, uh... <laughs> so, but I was able to get him for tonight. And I'm so glad you're here, and we're really looking forward to what he's going to do. So God wants you to come on up. Now, I, I want to kind of, oh, thank you so much, Marianne. I want to uh, kind of give you the, the drill here. Um, a lot of questions. We're going to start off with the ones that are written first. Uh, I might... Uh, you might have had questions that you have not written down that you would like to ask, and we can, you know, Lord willing, provide the opportunity for you to do that. We've got a microphone. Uh, perhaps we can get to that question if you did not write down a question. But I think what we want to do is go through these first, and then uh, your question may have already been asked uh, in one of these questions. So I'm going to let you be up here. I'm going to be down there. Take a lower seat. <laughs> so it's all yours. And uh, why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and we'll begin with our first question, if you would join with me. Father, thank you so much for uh, Don being here, and, and uh, Lord, thank you in advance for what you're going to do tonight. We're really looking forward to you, by your Holy Spirit, speaking in that still, small voice. Lord, we know that there are many unanswered uh, and good questions in this place tonight, and we're just looking for that wisdom from above, that's first pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without hypocrisy or partiality, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, a lot of uh, questions are similar, so uh, please, if I don't ask your question, do not take it personally. Of course, I don't know who wrote what question, and by the way, none of these questions are mine, so 
you know, no guessing like, ooh, I wonder if they wrote that, you know. So none of that, okay? Okay, John, this is a good one. Oh, wait, oh, wrong one, wrong pile. I've got like two piles here. This is a good one. I know you get it on pastor's perspective all the time. Do you think women should be a pastor? First of all, you want to know what I said to the guys in Israel in 94? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said he's not as tough as he looks. Yeah. <laughs> That's how they want you in the country, so that Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, should women be pastors? Yes. Uh, senior pastors know anything else? And yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, uh, my book gives women a lot more, I think, I don't know what the proper adjective is, uh, I don't want to say leeway, but uh, opportunities and a lot of, they've been given historically. Can we get an echo there or is it just me? Yeah, yeah. it's so. Okay, that is good. I thought I was losing my hearing. Yeah. Probably, there's nothing to do with the fact that there's an echo going. Anyway, um, you know, unfortunately, historically, what we've seen in the church is uh, women not be not given the privilege and the, the rights that they, they do deserve to be able to preach the gospel and to do what God's called them to do. However, what always happens is the pendulum seems to uh, swing from one extreme to the other. Uh, the main path, sorry, the main passage that uh, uh, deals with this, First Timothy 2, 9, 14, basically where the Apostle Paul says, I don't allow women to teach or have authority over a man, uh, is used and probably sets the stage for just the only limitations, as I read the Bible, that God gives for a woman. Now, and that is to be like the teaching elder of the senior pastor, as Jesus uh, had 12 disciples who were all male, and Paul then, when he uh, told Titus and Timothy in each city you go to, you know, to uh, appoint elders, uh, the, the, one of the uh, conditions was the husband of one wife, which of course, you know, that and the elder was ruled out women. However, on the other hand, uh, we learned in the book of Acts that when Apollos needed to be instructed more um, carefully in the scripture, it was Priscilla and Aquila who pulled him aside. And Priscilla was actually mentioned first uh, before Aquila. She was the one who took the lead there. Of course, we've got the prayer meeting down there. Remember in the book of Acts and Lydia running that? We've got Phoebe in Romans 16, who was called the uh, deaconess there at Sanprea, the church, church there. Um, if, you know, if you take this literally, which uh, too literal, which some people have done. That means you couldn't take any teaching whatsoever from a woman. That means that every time you get a Bible or read a Bible translation, you better find out what passages they have dealing with and, and translating because that's teaching. Or any book ever written by one. Of course, God didn't mean that. God set an order in the church, and we're supposed to follow that order to honor him and glorify him. But, um, you know, I think, like I said, for the most part, women have been kept back a wee bit from what the gifts God has given them. The problem is when once that was realized, you usually see the pendulum going to the other extreme. And the key is finding the biblical balance there. Yeah, that's a question we get quite often. And having two daughters, one thirteen and one ten, who both have been actually on the radio with me and uh, want to answer questions and want to be, particularly I was on Gabby when we broke her name, uh, wants to be <laughs> Tommy and is absolutely a genius and is brilliant. Uh, we want to plug her in the right way and encourage that sort of she's been really uh, struggling with this a lot, actually, and asking me a lot of questions to find out the place in the body of Christ, because God has gifted her amazing with, with gifts. So yeah, that's, that's a simple answer. Okay. I hope that helps. Okay, good. Uh, this is a, a good one, and uh, it uh, has been asked uh, more than once. So well, that's I, was a good one, too, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. How do you tell people that the Bible is God's word when they say it is not written by God, but by men, even though it's their account of what they witness. Oh, I'm glad someone asked that. Uh, you didn't mention my book in the back. Ten reasons to trust the Bible. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the reasons that I wrote it. How do you how do you respond to that? Well, the Bible is a trustworthy document, uh, and yes, it's written by human beings, but it gives evidence of something more than just purely a human inspired work. And in, just in a nutshell, what we do in our ten reasons to trust the Bible. Mention the fact, first and foremost, that only Christians can have a discussion like this. We're the only ones that open up to the public to ask any question you want. We take on all comers about the Bible and Christian faith. We're not afraid to take them on. And so only Christians can do something like this. The Bible is a unique book, one of a kind, a single soul, having no like or equal. And basically, why is that? 
Well, the Bible, not only the fact it's designed in a very divine way, the, the, the composition of the scripture, it's not only been accurately transmitted throughout history saying the same thing as when originally written, but it gives evidence of being the inspired word of the living God. And the main way we look at that is basically predictive prophecy, where the Lord predicts the future ahead of time. He tells us things that are going to come to pass for a number of reasons. First of all, we know that there's a God exists. Second, that we know there's a God who knows the future, but more important than that, there's a God who controls the future, too. Isn't that comforting? You know, it's one thing if God just knew the future, couldn't do anything about it. God of the Bible not only knows the future, but controls the future. I'll give you some passages. Isaiah 46, verses 3 to 5, 46, 3 and 5, and Isaiah 48, 9 to 10. Basically, the Lord in these passages says, how do you know that I exist? You know, how do you want to know that I do exist as God? And here's how, he, how you know he declares the end from the beginning are things that haven't happened yet, ahead of time. So when we know uh, when they happen, number we know a couple things. Number one, that he exists, that he's in control of history. Because no one can control, can know what's going to happen the next day. The weatherman didn't even get it right. But the God of the Bible knows what's going to occur, and he's told us specifically what will occur. And over and over and over again, we see God's word being fulfilled, divinely worked out, prophetically. And so, yes, the Bible was written by men, but it claims to be the word of God. But more than that, it gives evidence of being God's word. Jesus gave three lines of evidence to prove he was whom he claimed to be. Miracles, fulfilled prophecy, and coming back from the dead three days after his death. Each one of them by themselves is a powerful argument that the Bible is what it claims to be, and Jesus is the son of God. You put them all together, and believe me, that's, that's the final whammy there. Now, but the important thing to note, and again, this is a whole other topic. We can discuss it at length here if we wanted to, but we don't have the time. The New Testament is a reliable document. In other words, it says the same thing as when originally written. It's been handed down accurately to us. Plus, what it says matches up with known reality. In other words, as far as we can tell, the people, places, events actually took place as the New Testament says. So there's two things we learn from this. When we read it, we can be confident we're reading exactly what was written. And number two, when we read about certain events, certain things that took place and came to pass, we are, we are reading about things that actually did occur, real history. For example, it's been estimated that there are over 25,000 separate artifacts. Artifacts meaning um, archaeological artifacts, documents, uh, you name it, um, that basically verify historical characters or historical events that are recorded in Scripture. Over 25,000 of them backing up the story of both the Old and the New Testament as being true. In other words, even obscure people's names show up. Why? Because we're dealing with real people, real time, real history. One of the uh, things we've done uh, and are continuing to do is show that the Bible is an accurate document. You can trust it uh, for what it says and what it claims to be. But the thing that sets it apart from any other book is, again, predictive prophecy. God telling the future ahead of time, and he does that in so many times in so many different areas. If you were with us Tuesday night at the um, at Bill Stonebreaker's church, we talked about that in three different areas. We talked about fulfilled prophecy in the uh, life of King Cyrus there in Isaiah 44, 28 to 45, 6. This king was predicted to be the one who would allow Israel to go back uh, from their captivity, come back to the land, rebuild their city and temple. What's amazing about that, this prediction was made some 100 years before this person was even born, but he was named by name to release the people from a captivity they wouldn't even be in for another 100 years. And yet it all literally came to pass just as the Bible said. And we said there's many instances of that which there was no human manipulation or fulfillment that could put it together, only the divine word of the living God. So many reasons to believe the Bible, to trust it, but predictive prophecy is kind of the big whammy there. Okay. Um, we have a table in the foyer with Don's book, 10 reasons to trust the Bible. He's got a number of copies with him. Plenty. He did, how many? Plenty. Plenty. Plenty, plenty. plenty yes. Plenty. Okay. Uh, we're, they ran out of the DVDs, though, so uh, maybe we can figure out a way to get some okay, from sure. you. But Okay, but be sure, please, uh, pick up a copy of the book in the back in the foyer there on the table. Okay, Don, here's the next one. Okay. If a person received Jesus Christ and is saved, uh, then later walks away from the faith, is he uh, still saved? Oh, good question. All right. This is one that almost in every time we have a uh, session like this, it comes up. Um, and the question goes in various forms. That's very well put, by the way, uh, whoever asked it. Once a person believes in Jesus Christ and trusts him as their Savior, are they saved for 
ever, or is there a chance they may forfeit their salvation through, you know, behavior on their own? Now, let me say this at the outset. There are people, good people who differ on this, okay, who have a different perspective on this. Good Bible believers, and some of you uh, may have a different perspective than I do when I finish telling, say, what I do. Um, <laughs> This is, you know, there's certain doctrines you have strong convictions on, like on a scale of 1 to 10, like a 9 or a 10. This is one of them, and I have some very, very strong convictions on that. I believe very, the Bible makes it very clear that once you believe in Jesus Christ and have eternal life, that's exactly what you get, eternal life. And that means forever, not for three weeks, not till you sin, but forever and ever and ever. John 5, 24, Jesus said, He that believes on me has already crossed over, passed over from death unto life. Now, the word in, crossed over in the Greek is in the perfect tense. That means a past completed event with a uh, present, um, um, how can I put it, present uh, reality there. In other words, you've already crossed over, you have eternal life. It's an event that's been fulfilled in the past, but there's a present existing result. You still have eternal life. If, you know, John 3.16, if you believe on Jesus, you have everlasting life. Well, everlasting life is everlasting. It's not three weeks or till you sin or whatever. It's, it's forever and ever. John 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they know me. No one shall ever pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father, who is greater than I, you know, gives, gives them life. And over and over again, we have the passage very clearly that the Lord not only saves us, but he keeps us saved. Now, if someone says, and here comes the question, how about so-and-so? There's always the so-and-so. Here's so-and-so who became a Christian, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so backslid. What's going to happen to so-and-so? I don't know. I don't need to know what happens to so-and-so. God's going to judge so-and-so someday. But I know this. If you believed in Jesus Christ and you trust him as for your Savior, he's not only able to save you, but he is able to keep you saved. Because 2 Peter chapter 1 says, he, you, We are kept or guarded by the power of God unto salvation. And over and over again, we have promises in Scripture about the, the um, uh, completeness of the sacrifice that Jesus gave. It's complete. It's finished. And if, you know, if we have to add something to it, if we have to do something to keep ourselves saved, I think we're in real, real bad shape. Because, um, it, you know, and, and with, again, with all due respect, people would, would disagree with me. I ask, okay, you know, if, um, I, I ask a series of questions. We can lose our salvation, right? Yes. And I ask them, can you lose yours? They, you know, they say, Yeah. Okay, what specifically do you, can you lose it tonight, tomorrow? Well, I don't know. Well, what specifically, I want to know what specifically you have to do to lose it so I don't do it. You know what I'm saying? In other words, I want to know what, I, what, what would cause me to fall from grace so I don't do it specifically. And I don't want to hear this walk with the Lord or, you know, or be a mature, what does that mean? And then if I lose it, can I get it back? And if I get it back, do I have to get baptized again? And, you know, the such like, here, here's the thing. There are Christians who are carnal Christians. We've got to admit that. The Corinthian church was carnal. Look at, look at them, uh, the sins that were going on there. And yet, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, they're all saved when the rapture of the church comes. They're all going to be taken up because they're all in Christ. Now, 1 John 2.28, though, is a key verse. 1 John 2.28 says there are going to be people ashamed at the coming of the Lord, believers, because they will have no rewards to give him. They are saved, but saved as though by fire. Here's the illustration one of my professors used to give. So let's say you've got this two-story house, all right, and you're on the second floor one day, and all of a sudden you, you smell smoke, and you go, hmm. Gee, it smells like someone's barbecuing, and you look downstairs, and it's, your, you know, it's the downstairs. Your nice new house that you just had built is burning up, and the fire is coming up the stairs. Well, you, you, know, you see that you know, if you don't do something quick, you're about to die. So what do you do? You jump off the balcony, you, you hit the ground, you save your life, but as you look at your house, there it goes up in smoke. Now, you're going to probably have mixed emotions, aren't you? You're going to be real sad that your house burned up, but you're going to be very happy that you're saved. Well, unfortunately, there'd be a lot of Christians like that. Nothing really to offer the Lord with respect to works, but very happy they're there in heaven. So no, that, I think the position of the Bible is real clear. Eternal life means exactly that. If, if, if you don't get eternal life when you believe, if you don't have it forever, then it's not eternal life. Yeah. It'd have to be provisional eternal life, providing what? Providing we're faithful? Let me clue you in on something. He's the one faithful, not us. We are not faithful. He is the one holding our hand. We're not holding his, and hallelujah for that. Anyway, I can go on all night with that, but that's, that should be enough to get you my... Okay, you know, yeah. I love it. Okay. Um, this is a sort of a twofold question related. Why is, okay, Don, here's the question. Why is the gate more narrow than wide? Why is there hell rather than something less harsh as a believer in heaven? 
it would be okay for me that people do not go to hell? All right, that's a couple of ex excellent questions. First of all, uh, let me take the hell thing first. The Bible says we're saved from something, all right? Saved from something. Uh, not just from extinction or annihilation, saved from punishment. Hell is punishment for our sins. I think one of the problems we have is we have sinned against a holy God and we don't recognize the fact how intense and how terrible something like that is. We, we don't take sin as, as, uh, as it should be taken. We take it very lightly, unfortunately. Um, God has, says, basically, as he has created us in his image, we have been given immortality in the sense you and I are going to exist forever and ever. We're never going to cease to exist. All right, and so we're going to exist in one of two places, either with the Lord or without him. If we're not with the Lord, we're going to be without him, and hell is the place, Gehenna is called the place, the lake of fire, where we're going to live without him and be totally separated him with him from all eternity. Now, this is what the Lord tells us in Matthew 25, 41. The Lord Jesus said, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, okay? And so it wasn't prepared for humanity. Jesus Christ died, so no human being has to go there. But if a person willingly, knowingly rejects Jesus, there's no place else for them to go. And so that, since they've been made for eternity, you know, they're, they're made forever and ever, they have to go somewhere. And the place where they're going to be sent is called the Lake of Fire, Gehenna, or in the typical traditional English uh, lingo, we call it hell. And so that, that is what the Bible teaches about it. Now, let's make this clear. This is what God says is going to be the end result of people who reject him. It's not me, it's what he says. And so if there's a problem there, you got to ask him, not me. I'm telling you what his word says, and the Lord says he's a holy God who has died in the place of humanity, died for the sins of the world, so everyone can be in his presence. But if people refuse the free gift of eternal life, and since they're made for eternity, there's nowhere else for them to go. So they have to go to this other place. Now, why is the road narrow? Why is it so straight? Uh, I think one of the reasons why is because just of our own sin nature, particularly here in America, it's, it's difficult because, see, we want to do something, don't we? We want to earn our way to salvation. We want to feel like we've done it. And the gospel says we can't do anything. Jesus Christ has done it all. All we can do is believe. I don't know about you, but that's kind of humbling, isn't it? That uh, all we can do is believe. I can't, I can't add anything to it. Nope. All you can do is believe. And I think that is a stumbling block for so many people. It's a narrow way, straight is the way, narrow is the gate, and few there be that find it. But that few, uh, you know, representative is, is millions upon millions of people. Unfortunately, most people have just blinded their own eyes to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4 says, if our gospel is lost, it's hid, it's hid to those who are lost, whom the God of this age has blinded the eyes or blinded their mind, lest they should see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image. We have a satanic blindfold over us, and the Holy Spirit must remove that so we can see Jesus Christ. And that's what's going on. As the gospel's being preached, the blindfold's being removed, and people can see. Yet people can choose not to see. Let me give you an illustration. I was, uh, if you were here the other night, you've heard this, but uh, forgive me for giving it again. A friend of mine had this radio show in the Pacific Northwest, and what he would do is invite people on his program that came from various religious backgrounds. So this, this area was, was very famous for having a bunch of religious, uh, how can I put it in a nice way? Uh, how do you say kooks in a nice way? Well, anyway, they were different people, all right? They, 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 they were odd, oddballs, but he'd find these guys, actually lived in trees and all that, and had this very strange, strange beliefs. But he'd get them on there, let them talk, and let them give their pitch. Always, during the program, as he gave them a chance to talk about what they believe, he would always ask them this question, and he had many of them there. He said, if I could prove to you, to your satisfaction, not saying I could, but supposedly I could prove to your satisfaction that the Bible is God's word and Christ is the Son of God, would it make a difference? Again, not saying I could, but if I could, theoretically, would it make any difference? He said almost every one that he ever had on said the same thing. No, it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. Even if you could prove it to me, it still wouldn't make a difference. Now, where's their problem? Is it one of the mind? <laughs> no, it's one of the heart, one of the will. We read the 11th and 12th chapters of the Gospel of John. We see there was a man named Lazarus who was dead for four days. Jesus brought him back from the dead. And what was the response of the people? The religious leaders, the religious leaders all the more wanted to kill Jesus, but John 12 tells us they also wanted to kill Lazarus because he was evidence that Jesus was exactly whom he claimed to be. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, there's none righteous, no not one, no one looking for God. See, a lot of times we say, I found God. No, you didn't. He found you. 
he wasn't lost, you were lost, I was lost, he went after us, we didn't go after him, we ran away from him, he, he tracked us down, so let's put it in proper perspective. And so yeah, the gate's narrow, the way is straight, few there be but find it, but thank God some of us have found it, and actually he's found us. All right. Okay, good. Uh, concerning the rapture of the church, what are the three strongest scriptural evidence uh, to support pre-trip? Only three? Yeah. Oh, oh no, just kidding. Okay. Uh, it's inter interesting you say that. I've just done finished a series of books, a trilogy called the Last Days Trilogy. Um, the Jews, Jerusalem, and the Next Temple, the Rapture of the Church, and the Final Antichrist. And the um, uh, first is actually when we get back to the mainland, it should be there at the warehouse. The second one we, we just sent back yesterday to get printed, and the third one will be finished in about a week, and then in, they'll all be done in the next month or so. So that, the Rapture of the Church subject is the second one. That one we j I just sent off yesterday, so it's very fresh on my mind. Um, and again, this is a whole subject in and among itself. So just to explain it very uh, simply to you, the rapture of the church is that event that will take place sometime in the future when those that are living and alive and have believed in Jesus Christ, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. As they are caught up, they will be translated in the sense of given from this body, this mortal body, to an immortal body, from, uh, from perishable to imperishable. Immediately before that, the dead in Christ will be raised and given the same similar glorified body. So the body of Christ will be complete. We will meet the Lord in the air. Now, the, the fact that the rapture of the church is going to happen is very, very clear. It's taught 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. John 14, 1 to 3, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. So three passages make it real clear this event's going to take place. The question, when is it going to occur? Now, when in respect to a final seven-year period called the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, talks about one last seven-year period that's going to take place before the second coming of Christ to the earth. And so when, with respect to that final seven-year period before Christ comes back, will the translation of the rapture of the church take place? And Calvary Chapel, we believe it's going to happen before all that happens, this final seven-year period called the pre-tribulation pre view, pre-before this final seven-year period takes place. And there's a number of reasons why. Um, he said just three. The first one, what well, maybe the idea, we talked about it today on the radio program, the imminency, the any moment expectation. The New Testament writers had an any moment expectation of the coming of the Lord. In other words, we're told to watch and be ready. And yet, if the Lord is not coming back for his church at the beginning of the seven year period, what's there to watch and be ready for? We have to wait at least three and a half, three and a half years, five years, or seven years for the Lord to come back. And there's no expectation, no imminency, and really no desire to be ready at any moment, no, no motivation there. We can just say, well, you know, it's still a couple years off, I'll get my life together then. Uh-uh. The idea in Scripture is we need to be ready anytime because the Lord may come tonight, even before J.D. goes through those 3,000 questions you've written out for me. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we need to be ready, right? So that's one of the imminent coming of the Lord. That's, that's number one. Uh, a second reason why it seems the, the church won't be there um, is when you look at the nature of this final seven years, 70th week of Daniel. You read Daniel chapter 9, and what you find is there is a 490-year period that the Lord has determined upon his people, Israel, and 483 of these 490 years have come about. The last seven-year period will be God directing again with the nation Israel. Now, from day one in the history of the world, God has worked through only one redeemed people at a time. In the Old Testament period, it was the nation Israel. When they rejected Jesus, it's the New Testament church made up of Jews and Gentiles. The final seven-year period, the spotlight will again be on Israel. And so the church, Jews and Gentiles, are not necessary to be there because of one redeemed people he works with at a time, and that is, of course, the uh, nation Israel, which is emphasized there in the book of Revelation. So that's another argument. Um, oh boy, there's so many of them. The, the idea, and you look Revelation 6 through 19, the church isn't there on the earth. It seems to be there in heaven. There's uh, instances of that, uh, or um, you know, evidence of that. The church is in heaven with the Lord while the events are going on down the earth, the events of the 70th week of Daniel, the great tribulation period. Um, on and on and on. I think I had something like 15 reasons why the, uh, the church won't be here to experience the 70th week of Daniel, the great tribulation period. And, um, you know, there's people, the good people don't, don't hold that view, and that's fine. I don't, we don't have a big problem with that. Uh, they, they object for a variety of reasons. We try and respond to those. But also we're told in 2 Thessalonians 2, one last reason, something is holding back or restraining this final Antichrist, this final man of sin from coming to the world. 
And what's restraining him, the only power that seemingly can do it is a supernatural power, God the Holy Spirit working through the New Testament church restraining evil. When we go, uh, the Holy Spirit will still be working, but he'll have kind of a clean slate because we won't be here, and so evil will abound and abound and abound, although there will be a great revival at that time. So I think those may be three of the main arguments, the imminent or any moment coming of Christ, the fact that there's only... Uh, usually God's only work with one redeemed people, either Israel in the Old Testament, the New Testament church now to reach the lost, or the fact that restraining force can only seem to be God the Holy Spirit uh, restraining evil right now through the persons of us, the New Testament church. Now, just think about it. As bad as this crummy world is right now, can you imagine what it would be without the Christian influence, without our morality? We don't even want to think about that, do we? But that's what's going to happen, and that's why we're going to be literally out of sight. All right, J.D. Yeah. Uh, the word church is mentioned 19 times in chapters 1 through 3. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, when John is told to come up hither, all the way through chapter 19, which deal with the tribulation, the word church is not once found. Uh, and the reason why the word church isn't found in chapters 6 through 19, which deal with the tribulation, is because the church is not in the tribulation. That's why the word church isn't. And besides, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. We're already saved. And Man. the purpose of the tribulation for the salvation of the Jewish nation. Oh, okay. We've got a well-taught group here. <laughs> why, why did you ask me? Your yeah, answer was better yeah, than mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was great. Okay. I like that. <laughs> okay, what is the Christian view of suicide? What does the Bible <laughs> say about suicide? What about a believer who commits suicide? Okay, the Christian view of suicide is real simple. Don't do it. That's the Christian yeah. view. Um, <laughs> All right, suicide is murder. Uh, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. There's no object there in, in the Hebrew. That means that includes yourself. We cannot murder ourselves. Suicide is murder, murdering ourselves. It is probably the most selfish uh, sin anyone on this earth can commit because it leaves people behind always asking the question, why, what could I have done differently, why, what, you know, and the second guessing. Again, it is a very, very, very terrible thing uh, to happen. And so... Um, when I ever get the question, um, I, you know, I'm trying to be real precise the way I answer it. Um, uh, if, because there's two types of people, well, usually three that answer, ask the question. Some people are contemplating suicide. They ask the question. They want a, a go-ahead for me, and I won't give it to them, number one. On the other hand, there are people who have been experienced, been a family, had a family member, a friend who's committed suicide. They want comfort. And the comfort I can give, the person really knows Christ as Savior. We can give them comfort. Um, Suicide isn't different than any other sin. And someone will say, wait a minute, you can't repent from suicide. That's true, but there's a lot of sins you can't repent from. For example, let's say, you know, uh, the wife cooks this lousy dinner for the husband. I mean, really bad. And so she asks him, is it good? Oh, yes, it is. And he's lying. You know, is it good? He's lying. Finally, you know, uh, he's laying down in bed at night. And the finally, you know, before I go to bed, one last time, honey, was it good? It was wonderful. He closes his eyes and drops dead. Well, he dropped dead with a lie on his lips, right? I mean, he didn't repent from that. <laughs> so that can't be confessed. And so there's a lot of things that can't be confessed. And so, um, but suicide, you know, the, the Bible does speak about it, actually. There's a couple instances in Scripture. Uh, Amos chapter 2, verse, first couple verses, first verse, actually, where it talks about the king of, um, I'm sorry, that was cremation. Sorry about that. We got the suicide there with Saul. I was, because I was uniting that Saul, not only, uh, sort of committed suicide, as it were, had fell on a sword or was told, you know, had someone run him through. It depends who you believe, the Amalekite or, or the testimony in 1 Samuel 29. But, um, and then he got cremated too. I mean, he's got the double whammy there. But, but Saul seemingly took his own life. Um, and again, whenever this happens in Scripture, it's always looked as something negative because only God has the right to do something like that, to take a life in that sense. We don't take our own lives. It's, it's a terrible thing to do. And, and let me say this, no matter how difficult life seems to be with anybody, that is not the answer because what you're going to do is leave a trail of difficulty behind that you uh, wish you had never, never done. But then again, it's, it's one thing you can't go back on. We had uh, suicide in our own family, someone really close and I'll never forget it because um, the, the family member whose offspring committed suicide, you know, we talked about it and left with all these questions the rest of their lives. Why? You know, I, I can't understand. You know, what if we did this? What if we did that? And it's a very cruel thing to do to anybody. So hopefully none of us are thinking of doing that because the Lord always promises a way out. As tough as things are, there's always people who've got a lot, 
lot worse than us. And so suicide is something that the Bible speaks strongly, strongly against. And don't use Sam, uh, Samson as an example. Samson did not commit suicide. He was a warrior. He was fighting a battle, and he, he gave his life in battle and victory over the Philistines there. So he's not an example of suicide. He is a warrior taking the life of others and giving his life like the brave men and women that are now in Afghanistan and have been in Iraq, you know, um, supporting and, and uh, serving our country and defending our rights and defending us, and, and God bless them for that. But uh, that was what Samson, Samson was a warrior, and we need, certainly need more like him. Okay, J.D. Good. Okay, uh, this has uh, been asked a couple of times here. Who are the Nephilim, uh, Genesis 6-4? Who are these mighty men? Okay, who are the mighty men? Well, the Nephilim, Nephilim, if you read your translation in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, you read about um, two different personages, uh, the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, then you have the daughters of men. They got together, and uh, there were people born in that day, men of, now, men of uh, n name, men of renown, translations say, and it talks about the Nephilim were also in the world at that time and, and, and afterwards. Now, who are, who are the Nephilim is the question. Uh, Nephilim is actually a transliteration of the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is Nephilim, you know, and so uh, the translators, instead of trying to tell you what it meant, just transliterated it, put the word, it made an English word out of it, and said, okay, you figure it out. We don't have any idea. <laughs> um, some translations say giants. The uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, used gigantes to translate that, giants. The Nephilim seemingly were a type of people on the earth before the flood, and actually afterwards, too, we run into them in Numbers 13, verse about 30 and following. The giants that were there in the land, when, remember the, the, the spies got there and they said, they came back, uh, you know, and the, tw the ten, uh, as General Boykin said, the ten sissies, and then you got the two, <laughs> Joshua and Caleb, that said, uh, you know, the ten sissies said, you know, we're grasshoppers compared to these big dudes, and uh, they're giants, or they're like the Nephilim. Nephilim seems to be speaking of a, uh, a type of person that is kind of maybe large in stature and someone who's kind of got, you know, an appearance about him uh, that's very uh, intimidating, as it were. So it's not necessarily, there's no physical relationship of the ones before the flood to the ones after, but just a type of person. One tra um, commentary I read is sort of like the term hobgoblins, you know, something a scary type of person or a scary type of personage that were there before the flood and there afterwards. Now, we're not sure what the, what the word actually means. The Hebrew word nephal means fallen one. That's the verb to fall. But it, it, the Nephilim may be derived from that. We don't know. So it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult issue there in, in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. In fact, when we were in Spokane together, um, I, it, we did a class on the Old Testament, and um, we, we went through Genesis. Uh, Genesis class, actually, and we had that question, you know, the, the sons of God, the daughters of men, and the Nephilim, and the whole like it. I remember I took three and a half hours actually answering that, and then at the end of three and a half hours giving the five points of view, I was ready to move on, and someone raised their hand and goes, well, what do you believe? Oh, you remember I answered? I, I said, that, I'm yeah. going to tell you. You know, I'm gonna tell you, man, you figure it out. I give you, I have to spend three and a half hours giving you the different points of view. You know, you tell me what you think is right. So anyway, but that was, uh, it's an interesting question there. It's probably the most difficult interpretive question there in Genesis because there's a number of things going on. But the Nephilim just seemed to be a type of personage that was there before the flood and after, just a, uh, an intimidating type. And that's, I think that's the best way of dealing with it. Good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you know, he's not coming back to me, but someday I'll, I'll go to be with him. And David wouldn't mean dying. He meant actually to be with him. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, we're told by Peter that David was a prophet and spoke prophetically. So we believe that David was speaking prophetically in that case, that someday he would go to be with his son who died. Um, yeah, there's another example of that would be back what we talked about in the book of Numbers, an age of accountability. Back to the spies, they get to the edge of the promised land. They say, these guys are too big, Lord, you know, or Joshua, Moses, and that. You know, we're not, we're not going in. And uh, what happened? Um, the Lord made them wander for 40 years. And at that particular time, everyone age 20 and above had their bones bleached in the desert. Under 20 were not held accountable or actually were the generation that went into the promised land. So there was an, there was an a, or a cutoff age there at that particular time where God held one age group accountable and others not. Now, I remember the first time I ever told this story, I gave this illustration. Uh, his good friend Larry Brandt, a uh, Jewish fellow, he was in the congregation, and he's a funny guy, and he'd come to faith in Christ. He raised his hand and goes, Don, 
I'll be 20 in about eight months. Does that mean I can do whatever I want for the next eight months and I'm not held accountable? I said, no, Larry, in those days they lived much longer. Remember that, uh, 120 years and that? He was making a joke, obviously. We don't know what the age is. It's probably different for each person. But, you know, here's the thing. And, and let me give you a verse that I think is going to help, should help out immensely with questions like this, question about those that have never heard and the such like, is Acts 17.31. Acts 17, Paul is on the Areopagus there in uh, Athens. He's talking to the Greek philosophers, and he's talking about judgment that's coming. And he says this, God has set a day he's going to judge the world in righteousness, or righteously, or with fairness, by the one man whom he has chosen, even, you know, the Lord Jesus, whom he brought back from the dead. And so if God is going to righteously judge the world someday, that's all we really need to know, isn't it? Because God is righteous, God is fair. So when all the evidence is in, uh, we will all sing with the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So he's going to be fair. How he's going to do it, how, how he's going to set the age of accountability and the such like, we're not all sure, but we know God's a fair God, a righteous God, a holy God, and so we fall back under that. <laughs> One thing uh, you taught me, Don, is that we know from the scriptures that God is righteous, God is just, and God is fair. By the way, those classes, yeah. they were at 5.30 in the morning. If they, you don't not that we have those too, that's right. Yeah. I had to get up in the snow at 4.45. Yeah. Get, yeah. I had to yeah. test all those Costco donuts though first yeah, that's before right. you got there. I remember that. I'm still scarred for life yes. from that. Yes, anyway. that was a fun time. Um, okay, uh, this is a good one. What happens to the tribe of Dan? Uh, I knew about this question before it was going to be asked. I'm trying to try to get out of the wind here. Chosen. Uh, tribe, not listed Revelation 7, uh, and then there's a twofold uh, part to this. Could the chosen people of today have the same consequences as the tribe of Dan? Okay, the tribe of Dan is not listed in Revelation 7 with the 144,000. It's the one tribe omitted. So what we have, interestingly there, is Dan is conspicuous by its absence. However, when we come to the millennium, the first tribe mentioned is the tribe of Dan, so they are restored, so they're not obliterated or wiped out. For some reason, yeah, hallelujah if you're from the tribe of Dan, too. Uh, now, now what, what's interesting, why, and why is that the case? Well, Dan, if you know the story, was the first tribe that went into idolatry um, um, of all the tribes, and, um, and, you know, there was curses, in a sense, placed against it. So that's usually uh, the idea of why that, you know, they are not mentioned. That's, we're not told. Bottom line is we're not told why they're not there, but they're conspicuous by their absence. Dan, again, was first into idolatry, led the nation there. If you recall, Dan was given this plot of land, in, in, like in the, the Philistine country, but it, it kind of liked the grass is greener up to the other side, so it actually moved you know, away from where it's supposed to be and then came into idolatry. So Dan received the judgment, which is interesting, the word Don in Hebrew means judge. But Dan was judged, and they're not there in the, with the 144,000 of the ones sealed. But eventually, they show up in the millennium as one of the 12 tribes. So the temporary judgment, but then the grace of Almighty God, they do come back there during the millennial period. But Dan is somehow conspicuous by the absence. Some people have argued or thought, this has been speculated too, that either the false prophet or the final antichrist comes from the tribe of Dan, and that's why Dan is judged that way. We do not know that. Uh, there are some interesting possibilities there, but uh, we'll just leave it at that. Where the scripture is silent, we try to remain silent. Yeah. So that's the best we can do, because that's all it tells us. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, this has been asked more than once. I probably should have packaged it with the rapture question, but who are the dead in Christ that rise first? Uh, if believers are present with the Lord when they die, then who are the dead in Christ who rise first? Okay, yeah. yeah. Contrary to popular belief, the dead in Christ are not the Presbyterians. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, now, okay, who are, who are the dead in Christ? The dead in Christ are those who have died in Jesus Christ from the day of Pentecost until the time of the rapture of the church. Anyone who's known Christ as Savior and died, they are in Christ. They are died waiting for the resurrection. So what, what happens when a, a believer dies, their spirit, the real them, goes to be with the Lord, their body goes in the grave, but there's going to be a hope someday of a resurrection when the body is of the, comes from the tomb is raised and reunited with the spirit given a glorified body at the time of the rapture of the church. So you got two things going on. You got the dead in Christ rising, then you got those who are alive or are, are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and as they're being caught up, they're changed from mortal to immortal. So the dead in Christ are those who have believed in Jesus Christ from the time of the Pentecost when the New Testament church began until the time of the rapture of the church. And so they are believers who have trusted Christ as their Savior. Now, 
Interestingly enough, first few centuries of the Christian era, they, they're around the catacombs of Rome, there are literally millions of tombs there where Christians were buried. And these tombs were called, actually, coimeterias, where we get the word cemeteries. Uh, Koimeao in Greek means sleeping place. They're sleeping places because they believe the body's asleep, but the spirit's with the Lord, and someday the spirit and the body will be joined again. And that's why the cemeteries are sleeping places waiting to meet uh, the Lord in the air. And so, um, and what's interesting here too, the Christians buried their dead and the unbelievers would, would cremate or burn their dead because the unbelievers didn't believe there was any life after death. Christians believed there was life after death and so they would bury the dead to plant a seed to give a witness. Now that not necessarily mean, uh, you know, it's nothing speaking against cremation because uh, the Bible doesn't say anything one way or the other against that, but Christians did that as a testimony. And so one of the things we need to understand is that uh, Christians had a different view. They believed that when a Christian died, that body that was planted in the grave would one day be raised again by the Lord someday, given a new body while their spirit was immediately with the Lord, which I got to tell the story here. Okay. <laughs> one of the, um, one of the, um, um, we don't have them here, this whole long story. I did a series of DVDs as the, the Bible Explorer. You, you saw the one, 10 reasons. There are actually four others, but that, that's another story why they're not here. But anyway, I did one on the afterlife and one on heaven and hell. And at the beginning, there is a poem that I, I'd read many years ago. I don't know if you ever heard this one, J.D. The, this, this is great. There is a true story. Cemetery in Indiana. Old cemetery, there's a gravestone. And on the gravestone, someone actually had this written. Pause, stranger, as you pass me by, for as you are now, so once was I. And as I am now, so you will be, so prepare for death and follow me. Interesting. <laughs> Pause, stranger, as you pass me by, for as you are now, so once was I. And as I am now, so you will be, so prepare for death and follow me. Very clever. Anyway, someone walked by and read that, looked at it, then scratched beneath that the following words. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> good stuff. Hey, that always, that's a good one. Uh, there's multiple questions here. I'm going to try to see if I can maybe get, give you two of them here. Are there different levels of heaven? Is Catholicism a false religion? Are Catholics saved? Okay. Is that, that's three different questions? Well, there's like eight of them here, so okay, I'm trying yeah. to... <laughs> yeah, are there, are there different... No, there's not different levels of heaven. heaven. No, we're not going to have like, you know, the, the slum area and that and the, the tenements <laughs> of the... Uh, no, heaven's all first class. Now, there's different rulership you and I will have in heaven. We will, we're told we're going to judge angels, 1 Corinthians 6. Jesus talked about people having authority over uh, one, 10 cities, one five cities. Remember that when he gave the parables with, based on our faithfulness? But now heaven's all first class. There's no, there's no uh, dumpy place there in heaven. Thank the Lord for that because we're in the presence of the Lord. Uh, no levels. And again, remember this too. There's no such thing as... Um, Envy, pride, that kind of stuff, you know, uh, we're looking at someone else, covetousness, you know, so-and-so's got so many stars in heaven, I got so few, you know, that's not going to be there. That ain't going to be there, you know, and we can't imagine something like that, can we? Because we're people that think, you know, brother, so-and-so's got this and I don't have that. Um, so, no, there's, there's not going to be any, diff not going to be different levels. Now, we had a Roman Catholicism yeah, question. Is, our, is Catholicism a false religion? Are Catholics saved? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> how long have you said we had here? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, let me start back by uh, uh, saying this is, this is a topic we, we could go very long on. There's, there's a bunch of different issues here. Um, Roman Catholicism is, is unique in the sense, and we're talking about Roman Catholicism, if we talk, are Catholics saved? I always say, yeah, the Catholic Church are saved, and people go, wait a minute, I was a Catholic. It's, no, 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 I'm talking about the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic just means universal. Uh, we, are uni we are Catholic Christians if we believe in the universal church, that is the true church. It's the Roman Catholic Church where the issue lies. Are they saved? Of course, there's individuals in the Roman Catholic Church who are saved, but the church itself is not operating, we believe, um, along the lines of what God had set down. And there's a number of problems we, with all due respect, have with it. We, we respect the fact that the Catholic Church, Roman, Roman Catholic Church, believes in the doctrine of the Trinity. This, well, they believe in the same God, the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They believe, you know, in um, many of the same things we as Protestants believe. Where we draw the line with them is how a person gets into that relationship with the living God through faith in Christ. 
And then, the re and then where the final authority comes from. Does it come from the Bible or does it come from the Roman Catholic Church, which has authority over the Bible? In other words, where, where does the buck stop? Does it stop with a book or does it stop with the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church? And we would say it stops with the book. There's no, there's not the slightest hint in the book that we're supposed to, you know, yield to the authority of some institution. And even if there were, why yield to that institution? Why not, why not the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Church? You could actually make an argument they had started even before the Roman Church uh, historically. So um, basically what, what we do, you know, when I ever talk to someone who is Roman Catholic, I just ask them this, what are you trusting in? How are you going to get to heaven? Is it your works or what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you? And um, it's interesting, I have a lot of them that, you know, in spite of what the church teaches them, they uh, believe it's Jesus and, and Christ alone. And I said, you know, if you're trusting him, that's, that's what God expects. The problem, of course, is that all of the things that go along with that. And, and, you know, to me, a lot of the issues that divide us are secondary issues, but it's the main two are, you know, where does final authority come from and how does a person get right with the living God? Um, talk about will we see them in heaven, are they saved? Someone once said, that when you get to heaven, there'll be three things that are going to be shocking right away. The first thing is you're going to see people in heaven you didn't expect to see there. Oh, he made it. I didn't, you know. Yeah. Number one. Then the second shocking thing is you're not going to see people there you expected to see there. Hey, where's brother so-and-so? Brother so you know, he's not there. And the third shocking thing is people will be shocked and surprised to see you there. So anyway, um, Anyway, um, no, it's thank God he's going to do the judging and that he knows the hearts. Um, uh, but no, the system we believe is is not God's system today. We don't we don't give any gra we grant any authority to the Roman Church or the Pope. We don't believe anything he says is ex cathedra speaking from the throne of from the the throne of the Lord or that. No, not at all. But um, um, again, that's a real interesting issue. We can go long and hard on uh, if we ever want to get into it. Okay. Jay. Okay. Uh, there, there was a, a number of questions regarding the uh, sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to uh, present it to Don because it was uh, asked and answered beautifully at the uh, pastor's conference uh, this last week, and uh, we're going to acquire the CDs and uh, MP3s uh, and DVDs of all the conferences and make them available to you uh, free of charge, So, but you'll have to wait. So... Uh, hold on to that if that's your question. I know it was asked a couple of times. So let me ask you this, Don. Okay. Uh, my question is in regards to Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. My question is, how can Jesus grow in favor with God, becoming a friend of God? If Jesus is God, how can Jesus become? Is he not already a friend of God? Are they not both one? Luke two fifty two. No, good, good question, and, and that's one also where he, you could, you could also cross reference that with Hebrews chapter five, where it said he learned obedience too. I think here's here's what we're dealing with in Luke two fifty two and Hebrews five and the such like. We're dealing with something that we've had no other example of this in history, where the living God becomes a human being. You've got one person, but two natures: one hundred percent human, one hundred percent divine, in one body. As God, he cannot grow, he cannot learn, but as human, he can grow, he can, he can develop, he can learn, he can grow in favor of God and, and, and humans, and that's exactly what he did. And what it talks about favor of God is by his obedience. Again, Jesus emphasizes the fact he does always those things that please the Father. So you have to read this in light of the fact that God becomes a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. He obeys God, and he gains favor as being, you know, as trusting him in as the you know as God the Son, but also as the perfect human being. Now, what's interesting? First John two six tells us where to pattern our life or walk as Jesus walked. And if Jesus did everything totally and you know with respect with his divine nature, that wouldn't be real encouraging to you or me, would it? Because we're not we're not deity, we're not divine. But the fact is, he is fully human, and as a full human being, he trusted God the Father. He grew in stature he grew in wisdom and human wisdom he did and yet he grew in favor because he obeyed god the father now if you i don't know if you ever thought of it this way i remember i heard a pastor say this once i thought it was really brilliant remember when jesus was baptized you had the trinity there together god the son being baptized god the holy spirit coming down luke tells us on him on in a bodily form as a dove but then the voice of god the father said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased Notice God the Father was pleased with Jesus right then. Pleased with what? 
not pleased with his miraculous works. He hadn't performed any miracles, not pleased with his teaching, hadn't taught anything, pleased with 30 years of, in obscurity of living in total faith to God the Father, pleased with the everyday, day in, day out task that he was given until it was time to reveal himself to the world. So God the Father was pleased with us just being consistent without doing anything spectacular. And that, you know, that got me when I heard that. I thought that was really profound because the pleasing of the Father with Jesus was his obedience. And he was obedient until the death, even the uh, Philippians 2 tells us, the death of the cross. And so uh, as, as a full human, 100% human, he could grow. And he could. He could grow in knowledge, he could grow in, in stature, and he could also grow in favor with God. And that's exactly what he did. The favor increased as he was completely obedient to God the Father in his life. Good. Um, this is a combination of uh, two questions from one of which is my son, and uh, one of them is my son's friend. Okay. So uh, the first part is when God made Adam and Eve, how old were they? Uh, and then uh, the second part is, how long were they in the Garden of Eden? <laughs> that's, that's a two really good, excellent questions. When God made them, how old were they? Well, the day he made them, they were one day old. I mean, that's, that's, that's how old they were, right? I mean, now, the question probably is, how old did they look? That's yeah, a, Okay, yeah. that, I think that's usually what's asked. God created Adam and Eve as full-grown adults. Now, what's a full-grown adult? I remember one time on the radio a number of years ago, a, a young lady called up and said, uh, when we get to heaven, will we be, you know, um, you know, will we be kids like I am now, or will we be full-grown adults? I said, we'll be, you know, when you get to heaven, you'll be a full-grown adult. She goes, wow, when I get to heaven, I'll look like I'm 16. You know, and I thought, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess it depends on one's point of view what a full-grown adult is when you're eight or nine. I guess that's a full-grown adult. But anyway... They probably looked, you know, fully grown, 25, 30 years of age, something like that. We don't know. We're not told, bottom line. Um, how long did they last in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? Well, let's put it this way. Not very long. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably highly likely this is possibly the first or second day. It didn't take long for them to, to sin. Now, you're going to think that's not real good, uh, and we're not really happy with that. In fact, Gail Irwin gave the illustration the other day. He said there's going to be two long lines in heaven. One line is there to, you know, to worship Jesus. The other line is to beat the snot out of Adam, you know, because uh, of, um, of what he's done, because he's caused all this problem. People be lining up to do it. Now, but here's the thing. Let's face it. If it was you or me, we would have done the same thing sooner or later. Don't think, oh, if I were there in the garden, yes, you would have. Yes, we all would have. We all would have. You know, Adam was there. He, he represented us, but we would have, we would have. We would have done it too. But the fact is, he's, it's already done. It's been, been there. And probably not, not real long. Probably weren't long in the garden. Uh, they didn't have any children uh, since they were created perfect and they were told to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we assume that Eve would have conceived right away. And so given that fact, it probably, probably didn't take long for them to fall as it wouldn't take you and wouldn't take me very long either. Okay, okay. great questions. I love them Excellent. from the younger ones. They're always yeah. the tougher ones, the, yeah. the better ones. Um, you know... I, I want to give those of you who did not have a chance to or did not know about writing down a question, if you would like to ask a question, uh, don't be bashful. I'm going to uh, bring the mic. Uh, would you mind coming up so we can get you uh, on the video and blackmail you? <laughs> I'm just we, we're, on, we're on tape here now, video <laughs> yeah, too. That's right. So behave. You know, yeah, no, no. He's, he's going to behave. Smile at the camera. Um, my question is in reference to uh, the, the question that came out and somebody believing and then falling away from the faith. Are they, mm -hmm. are they saved? And I know that, that in the book of James is talking about somebody, it's talking about the demons believing and even the demons believe in shudder. So I would, is, is it a legitimate statement to say that that person probably wasn't in the faith in the first place if they did fall away? Oh, that's, that's a fair question. It's a good, and, and the bottom line is we don't know. And, and, and that's the key. We really don't know that that person really did or did not believe. The Bible talks about false prophets. Remember that among us? And there's also 1 John 2, 2.19, I believe it is, where it says they went out of us because they weren't with us. If they were of us, they would have remained with us. One of the keys is that um, false prophets and false teachers will come into the church. They will pretend to be Christians, say the right word, say the right thing, but then eventually leave because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. 
So your question is well taken. Is it possible these people never believed in the first place? They didn't have the faith. They may profess Christ. And I'm sure that's true in a lot of cases. The problem is we don't know who's whom. There are also people who profess Christ, fall away into sin, but then come back as the prodigal son there. And the good, you know, here's the great thing. I'm glad none of us have to judge that. Aren't you glad that you don't have to judge people's hearts? When I started this Bible study, or I was one of the leaders of it in 1970, we had a bunch of young kids that had just come to Christ. And I remember looking at the people walking through the door, and there were certain people who were just outstanding believers in Christ. I thought, you know, God is going to use these guys, these gals in some mighty ways. And there were others that walk in the door and I said, I'll give them about three weeks and I'm never going to see them again. Well, guess what? It's the three weak people that are still standing with the Lord, having some of the most wonderful ministries. And the guys and gals that could never fail, they failed and we haven't seen them again. So I don't know. We can't tell. We don't know. God is going to be the judge there. But the question James is talking about is a whole interesting issue there in James chapter 2. Um, and there's different ways of looking that, at that, right? The demons do have faith in the sense they know that uh, the Lord exists, but they don't have any relationship with him either. You know, you can acknowledge intellectually that Christ is God the Son. In fact, there are many people that do that. There's a uh, uh, over and over. I'll give you an example. There was, um, when he did the Bible study there long ago, there was a young lady who was taking a class at uh, one of the local universities, and she was, she had to ask me a question after the, after the, after the um, Bible study one night. She was just dumbfounded. She said, uh, she had this class in, in classical Greek, and somehow they got around to talking about Jesus and the resurrection. And she was listening to the, the professor's explanation, and it sounded like someone who actually believed that Christ came back from the dead. So she said she hung around after class and said, Professor, you just talked about, you know, Jesus coming back from the dead. And it sounded like you really believe that that's, that's what literally occurred. And he said, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think the evidence is so, you know, so overwhelming that, of course, you know, he, he, he did come back from the dead. And she says, well, pardon me for saying so, but I've been in your class all semester and you never impressed me as a Christian, you know. And he said, well, well I'm not. And he, she said, no, wait a minute, you just told me that you believe that Christ came back from the dead. He said, yeah, but you're not a Christian. No. Do you realize the consequences you will suffer? She bluntly asked him that. Yes. And she said, why not? Why aren't you a Christian? And he said, I don't want my life changed. I'm very happy with the sinful life I'm living right now. All right. Well, okay. So um, he knew the facts. He knew it was true. You know, all the demons believe they know what's true. A lot of people out there know what's true but uh, they don't do anything about it. I think James is talking about that type of person, a true faith in Christ. There will be something there, and that's, I think that's what he's talking about. Okay? You know, there are so many good questions here, Don, and I'm just wondering, can I give you a couple sure, you can give me anything you want. Yeah. rapid fire? I got a lot of water here. left, so uh, you don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep the water coming back there. Uh, I, what, what, what do you think about a couple of rapid fire ones? I mean, just, okay. you know, like... Okay, yes, yes, no, John 3.16. Okay, okay so that's good. All right. Let's close the prayer. Thank okay, you there for we go. coming, and we have a potluck. Okay. Oh. oh, you're going to ask me the questions? Yeah, just, I, I just, just want to give quick, you the yeah. answers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That way we skip the question, we get to the answers. I know, you know, Don, he knows the answer before we even ask the questions. So. Okay, what's the questions here? We haven't okay. seen any of these. What are uh, they? What, what is your opinion of the rap, partial rapture theory? It's wrong. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, <laughs> uh, we deal with that. Actually, what I do in the book, I go through all the seven major theories and give the strengths and weaknesses. In the pre-trib, I say that's the one that has, you know, I think got the answers to, and I, I deal with the objections. Partial rapture, pre-trib. Yeah. Mid-trip, post-trip, you know, and pre-wrath yeah. and that, and then no, ra no rapture theory, too. So, okay. uh, Tarshish yeah. in the Bible, uh, Ezekiel yes. 38. Yes. Uh, where is that? Uh, we don't know. We don't know, okay. No, it's, it, it could mean a far-out place, an outer place. Somewhere right. it could be an outer island or something like that. It could be a geographical place. Or it could be a Hebrew word meaning somewhere out there. The Not sure. The young lions, you know, has, some have suggested it could be the we don't know. young nations. Yeah, okay. I know, I know. Are UFOs demonic? Well. Beings. Are they? Well, now, that's... You, that's not, well, that's not something you can answer just yes or no. Okay, okay. S uh, some, because, okay, are there such things as UFOs? Yes, there are unidentified flying objects. Now, <laughs> are these unidentified flying objects demonic? Some, possibly. Some are just misidentified, right? Okay, I know there's, there's all sorts of theories. Uh, uh, natural phenomena might explain it away, you know, uh, or, you know, certain uh, things the military are testing and and of course it's you know it's high it's possible you know that some are um then again here here's the problem i, I have with the uh, the that sort of thing and actually i got it from one of my um uh, professors in uh, college who wasn't a christian when i went to a non-christian school he said i don't have a problem necessarily with believing the idea that you know we could have 
some type of alien visitors. My only question is how come they always crash land in some manure field in Mississippi yeah. and they talk to some guy, you know, that um, can barely get a complete sentence out and there's, they're the one who's been kidnapped and he, he's the one who they communicated with. It seems a little suspect there that, you know, they, they, they can master, you know, um, the physics and, you know, an interstellar travel to such a place but they have to crash land in some haystack or something and it just, something just doesn't seem right there. That's, that's anyway, that, I know I like that explanation. I thought that was as good as any I've ever heard. So, okay, that uh, wasn't rapid fire. I'm sorry. No, it's <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. Uh, and, and how they fit into the Bible. Yeah, they're, God created all the animals, fifth and sixth day. The um, birds and the fish and the fifth day, land animals on the sixth day, they're part of God's original creation, Job 38 to 41. Uh, Job seemed to have seen two different animals we would classify as a dinosaur, the behemoth and the leviathan. Those are actually transliterations, again, of the Hebrew. Behemoth means behemoth, leviathan, leviathan. Behemoth sounds like uh, what we would... Uh, used to term brontosaurus, which never existed, by the way. Uh, it's a, a patasaurus was probably a closer uh, description to that. But uh, you know, I, I, that's, thank you. Fine. Oh, there you guys are in the front. I wonder. Um, so yeah, the uh, yeah, it seemingly lived at the same time as humanity, which of course would kill the theory of evolution, which the dinosaurs, um, you know, died out 65 million years ago. And so if this, okay, so anyway, if, if we're going rapid fire, I had a joke, but I won't tell it. Go ahead, we just move on. We're rapid fire here. Uh, you want to ask I want to ask the question, uh, when the Bible in Revelation says that the sea gave up its dead, do you have any speculation what that means, like they're talking about? Yeah, the, the sea usually refers to like the nations in the world that gave up their dead. In other words, what it's talking about, everything gives up the dead, you know, um, when there's a final judgment, in other words, all those who have died, wherever they died from the nations, comes out of the sea, come out of the land. Uh, we're told the, the, the first beast and the second beast, the first beast comes out of the, the sea, which usually refers to the nations. The second beast comes from the earth, which may be, refer to Israel, the land of Israel. The sea gave up the dead means the nations give up their dead. Everybody gives up the dead. In other words, the final judgment, everyone's there, not necessarily the ones that have died at sea or anything like that. Everyone is there at the judgment. In other words, it's comprehensive is what it's trying to say, probably, most likely. In other words, all that have died are going to be in front of the great white throne there that have died outside of Christ. That's an excellent question, though. Good. Uh, okay, let's, uh, Renee, you want to come to you? Yeah, the lady in the, the back camera. in the red there. <laughs> on camera. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll see if I can get this question out. Um, I've been hearing a lot of Ezekiel 9 recently. And so um, my question is, do you think that the Christians, believers celebrating Christmas, uh, having Christmas trees, celebrating Easter, is something detestable unto the Lord? Okay, is celebrating Christmas or Easter detestable unto the Lord? Not at all. Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, and by the way, the passages there in Jeremiah and that have nothing to do with the modern Christmas tree or anything like that. Uh, Easter is an unfortunate word. It's actually the Passover, which the, you know, when the time that we're, the King James says Easter there when they're in, in, in Jerusalem for Easter. No, it was Passover. Easter is a, a term that's been brought into the Bible. It's not biblical there. Um, no, I think with Christmas and Easter, you need to celebrate in the right attitude. You know, uh, Easter celebrates the time Jesus came back from the dead, and by all means, we want to celebrate that, whatever you want to call it, Resurrection Day, or whatever, and call it whatever you want. Easter is the popular term now. If you ask 100 people here in Oahu what Easter means, 100 of them say, well, it's the, you know, the celebrating the resurrection or search the, the roots of that and the pagan origins of that. No one thinks of that right away, in other words. Same thing with, um, with Christmas, you know, with the Christmas tree and all that. Yeah, a lot of the, the things with respect to the Christmas tree have are pagan in origin. But remember, Christmas, we're, we're trying, well, we should be anyway, celebrating the fact that God the Son was born at a particular time in, in, in history. Now, what we do at our house, and what I learned that from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, the first year at Christmas time, instead of Merry Christmas, we had these little signs that Happy Birthday Jesus. And so we'd show them to people, and we and people thought, Oh, yeah, that's what it's all about. So if we can say Happy Birthday Jesus instead of Merry Christmas or that horrible Happy Holidays, then we can really, you know, let the people know what the season's all about. And so, no, I don't think there's a problem with that. If, if you want to have a Christmas tree, fine. If you don't, fine. Um, we do it when our family, but our kids know that, you know, that, um, you know, Christmas is all about Jesus and not about presents and that, and that's where it's at. Good question, though.
we're, we can go a little bit longer. We're used to it. Trust me. I, they are. Yeah. Yeah. You're long-winded? You're we, yeah, probably. No, yeah. And nothing's changed. Then, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, if you have to go, uh, you know, go, okay? All heads bowed, eyes closed, leave at this time. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, staying can we, can stay, yeah. a little bit longer, yeah. to do. Uh, we can take a few more questions. And again, I, I know there's a lot of good questions that were written down. I know there's a lot of you that have a lot of questions. So try to, if you can, in the interest of time, be as brief as possible. And uh, something that made me think. You said something about Christians that are buried and they were, you know, to be uh, resurrected when the Lord comes. Mm -hmm. My question is, what about the Christians who chose to be cremated, believing that, you know, there was nothing wrong with it? You know, because you got me thinking when you mentioned that. Okay, good question. No, what we mentioned too, we said cremation is, uh, let's put it this way, whether a person's buried or cremated as a or later. Um, so no, no, there's not, you know, with, with cremation, sometimes there's financial, you know, reasons that happen. Sometimes the request of the person and some land to do it. Um, I understand uh, Tokyo, you can't bury the dead there. Is that not right? There's no room for cemeteries, because I've, I've been told that anyway. And I know there's some place in the world, because the population is so dense, there's really no place to actually bury the dead, so cremation's the only impossibility. The Lord understands that. The, the point I was making in the early church, the pagans used to burn their dead because they were making a statement by it, and everybody understood that. The Christians in opposition to that would bury their dead, saying, no, we believe in something afterwards. But no, no, God's got to pull us all back together anyway, one way or another, you know, uh, and so um, whether we're cremated or, or buried, bottom line is, you know, he's going to have to do a miracle anyway in putting us back together, giving us a glorified body. So I, it's, it's really, a, in a sense, a non-issue, as it were. Okay, good question. One back here. Yes, sir. Yes. A thousand years. I was wondering if you can ex, um, expand on that and tell us something about yeah, that. Yeah, in Revelation chapter 20, seven times it talks about a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And at the end of the thousand years, there's a judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment. The millennial is a time where basically the conditions that were there in Eden will come back to the earth where there'll be peace basically upon the earth. There will still be sin, but there will be, it will really be lowered. There'll be people going into this millennial period they actually have bodies like yours and mine, not the New Testament church, but people who believe in Jesus during that final 70th week of Daniel, final seven-year period. They will have children, and their children will have a chance to believe in Jesus. What is mind-boggling but not totally incomprehensible is the fact that at the end of that period, where the Bible says Satan, who had been bound for those thousand years, is released, he will deceive the nations, and countless people will actually follow Satan and rebel against God. Even though they've been living in peace, they, don't, they know God, Jesus is God the Son, that God has all these wonderful things, yet still they will refuse to believe in him. And the problem is simply this, the human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, who can know it? And that's what problem we will see at that particular time. And so, yeah, there'll be a thousand-year period of time where there will actually be people living on the earth who know God exists, know that Jesus is God's son, know all the truth, and still won't make any difference. No, no atheist in that day at all, but still people will refuse to believe. Human heart is wicked, and uh, that's why we need a Savior. Can a person with Alzheimer's be led to Christ? That's, that's a good question. Um, as long as a person is, is breathing, you know, and alive, I would try and get the gospel to them. The problem is sometimes people get to the place where they've, they've gone past the level of comprehending, you know, the gospel and that. Um, let me, let me say this. I don't know if this may not relate to the same thing, but I know people in comas can certainly hear what's being said. We have a good friend. When last two years ago, we looked for a while, my wife and daughter's in Iowa, and um, tremendous testimony, as young lady have. Um, Deb Hayworth, she um, got encephalitis in a trip down to Mexico, and the doctors basically said, uh, get your family together because she ain't going to live. And there's a lot of prayer going up for her, 
a lot of, um, you know, and the doctor said even if she lives, you know, she won't be able to function, but there's not a, even a chance, very small chance she's going to live. Will Deb not only survive, but is as capable as you and I, if not more capable to this day. God miraculously not only healed her, answered, answered the prayers, but brought her back. You know, it took her a while to get back to normal, but she got back. She said while she was in the coma there, uh, she could hear everything that was going on. And people, you know, are pl they're planning her burial and all that. She's listened to that. And, uh, she, you know, and then and she's talking to the Lord. And the Lord showed her to know that she still had something for her. Now, she was in a coma and still alive. Alzheimer's, unfortunately, sometimes people get to the place where they can no longer understand. Now, what's interesting, you know, many of us have had relatives with that. My mother had that. She could comprehend things, and she would talk about events that happened 50, 60 years ago, like it were yesterday, but she couldn't remember five minutes ago. So there's still some type of comprehension there. Now, when it gets to dementia, that's a whole other issue. And I, I don't know, as, as, as long as someone's still breathing, if you feel the, the need to tell them about Jesus, I'd keep doing it. Not, no harm done you know, and tell them their need, and something, you know, who knows what God the Spirit might do in a heart. I, I believe in, you know, fighting to the very last drop of blood, as it were. I don't believe in giving up, and if it's on your heart to do it, then all more power to you. Go for it. We don't, we don't know. God's, God's faithful and a good God, and if he puts it on your heart, then I, I would do it, you know, all the way. I'm going to read this question because uh, I must have scared them with the whole camera thing, so here we go. <laughs> Uh, it's actually two questions. First one, is 10% tithing, tithing given to the church or only, or can it be given to other uh, help, uh, such as charities? In other words, do you have to just give, yeah. Does the tithe go to the church, or can it go to other charities? Yeah, it should first and foremost, your gift go to the church. If you people are being taught here and learn here, that your, your support should be here first and foremost. Above that, if you want to give other places, you should do that. But first and foremost, you, you, you definitely go to the church, the place where you're getting fed by the gospel. That's, that's, that's where it should go. And this, and again, there's no limit to percentage you can give. 10% is a good starting point, but you're certainly not limited to that. The tithe, actually, in the Old Testament was a tax and it actually came to 23%, not 10%, if you want to get specific about it. But um, it's a good place, a good number to start. And, but the Lord's looking at our hearts. You know, we want to give and test God. You know, we give and we say, Lord, I don't have much, but I'm going to give it to you. And the Lord, Lord we could ask or think. And one of the things that, that kept coming in my head is like the Lord said, you know, do you really believe in me? Do you really trust me? And I did, even though, you know, <laughs> where are you, God? I know you're there. But, and he did come through in miraculous ways. But um, test God in the sense that, you know, Lord, only me and you know what's, what's going on. I trust you. I can see you. Uh, I mean, I can't, you can see me. I can't see you. I know you're there. And, uh, but I want to believe in you. I want to, you know, take a step of faith. And, and he's, believe me, more than able and above and beyond what we ask or think he can respond to. So um, anyway, it's God's, God's faithful that way. Don't, don't neglect doing that. Even if you're having tough times, trust God. Believe me, you won't, won't regret it. Remember the first time I tithed, I was scared to death. And then when I saw what God did and how God blessed me uh, for honoring Him with the first fruits of my wealth, I went from being scared to death to tithe to scared to death not, not to, to tithe. Yeah. 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 So, uh, sweetheart, I see your hand. I'm going to bring the microphone to you, but I want to ask one more question here that's written down on this piece of paper. Okay, sweetheart? Uh, some Christians believe uh, belief is that when receiving the Holy Spirit, it is evident by speaking in tongues. Is this biblically true? Should we be talking in tongues? Uh, no, it's not biblically true. In 1 Corinthians, we all speak in tongues in the way the verses put in the Greek. In fact, you read the book of Acts, it only shows up on uh, rare occasions. The Apostle Paul, we're not told he spoke in tongues when he was saved there in Acts chapter 9 in Samaria. There's no in indication that people spoke in tongues there in Acts chapter 8 when they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's no indication on the day of Pentecost when the 3,000 believed that they spoke in tongues and received the Holy Spirit. So, no, not a sign. Okay. This young lady has a question, Don. Oh, hi there. Um, are dragons real, and if they are, are they evil? Did you, is it dragons, is that what are you asked? Are dragons, dragons real? real, and if so, are they evil? That's, that's an excellent question. Dra you know, dragons, I believe they are real, and they have been. There's a, there's a lot of ancient testimony to dragon-like creatures and cave paintings and this and descriptions of, of uh, creatures that have existed that seem to have certain characteristics and, and, and the evidence seems to be so widespread uh, that they did exist at one time. Now whether they're still there they became extinct is another problem a question, but no, they would, of course they wouldn't be evil. The problem is when we get the word, you know, in the 
New Testament, we get Satan compared to a dragon, so we think, well, dragons must be evil. Now, there's certain characteristics of the dragon that we, we align with Satan in that, the fire-breathing type of beast. But, um, you know, look at this way, Satan's also called a lion, a ravenous lion, but so is the Lord Jesus. You know, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5, 5, but we're told in 1 Peter 5 that, you know, Satan goes around like a lion. He is not, Satan isn't a dragon. He is like a dragon. He has certain characteristics, but no, no, if we ran into a dragon, well, I guess we'd have to be careful when we would not, uh, um, but uh, no, they're not evil per se. Any creation of God, any animal created by God initially was certainly not not evil, and even the ones that, are, that can be harmful to us are not necessarily evil. They all have their place here on the earth. You know, they, they belong here just like we do, although we have dominion over them, and we need to respect them, but then again, we're the only ones been created in the image of God, and, and we need to appreciate that and treat others likewise. But good, excellent question, as the young ones always ask these great ones. Okay, we have one back here. One back, one way in the back, all right. You can tell it's going to be another good Hello? one. Okay. Um, I had a friend ask me a question, and I wasn't really fully able to answer it, but he asked um, why, in regards to the imminency of Christ's return, um, why did Paul think it would happen in his day, and maybe not the full canon of Scripture, or I wasn't sure. Okay. Let me see if I got the question right. And, um, was The question was why Paul believed that Christ would return soon. Was that what you asked? That's how I heard Oh, the eminency of, oh, okay, well, okay, good. The eminency of return, thank you. Um, Paul believed, as every generation of Christian has believed, that Christ may come at any moment. He has put himself in the category, we which are alive, that it may happen in his lifetime. But then he realized that it was getting near the end of his life, he probably would not see it. Second Timothy 4, he realizes his death will probably precede the coming of Christ. I think the reason the Lord has done that is to give each generation the expectation of the potential of Christ coming to live in light of that so at any moment we can be ready to meet him. Because let's face it, uh, Christ may not come in our lifetime, but Christ may come for us, as it were, any moment, right? I mean, when, uh, who of us has a guarantee we're going to live until the end of this day? None of us. And so I think it's the imminency not only of the coming of the Christ, but the fact that, you know, uh, our life may end any time is why that was put in there. And also it's to live in the expectancy, to, you know, to live righteously, to live, you know, in the moment. I think that's the reason we see that in the New Testament. Uh, plus the fact it was possible, too. Uh, from the human standpoint, our standpoint, Christ could come in any moment. It's only, you know, it's in God's great timing that we wait to see the coming of Christ, not ours, but we need, need to live in that expectancy because he may come tonight. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Excellent question. Okay, we're all agreed on that one. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Next yeah, question. question. Yes. My question is um, regarding to what you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the seven-year tribulation. Yes. Um, that reference is found in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, my question is, the last week, uh, the one week, which is part of the 70th week, mm -hmm. uh, how do you explain if that one week is part of the 70th week? Because you mentioned the 483 years mm -hmm. plus that seven years. How do you explain that seven week uh, to be in the future if it's part of the 70th week? Okay. Okay, good question. Um, in the book of Daniel, uh, the, the nation Israel, like we said, God said there's 490 years of their history, and when the 490 years are over, then everlasting righteousness will come in. We're told that, at, and the 77s, the sevens are, are, are years, 490 years, we're told after 69 of the sevens, or 483 years, after that time, there's an interval period. The Messiah will be killed, he will be cut off, and then the city and the temple will be destroyed by the coming prince. Then, after that interval is over, there'll be one final week or one final seven-year period, Daniel 9, 27, where there's a, a covenant confirmed or made by this coming man of sin with the nation Israel. And so we're in the interval period because what happened was sometime during the time of Christ, the, 70, the, the 69 sevens, the 483 years stopped because after, the Bible's very clear in Daniel, it's after the, the 69 sevens 
that the Messiah is killed, uh, the city and the temple are destroyed, and then it picks up, and then sometime there's a covenant made. Well, what happened was um, Jesus died, you know, uh, the city and the temple were destroyed within about a generation, but there's no um, covenant made or confirmed since that time, and the seven year, final seven year period actually culminates in the second coming of Christ. So we are living in an interval period right now between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. There's the assumption there of that interval there as the way it's explained to us in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which is another one of those topics that would be great to take about 45 minutes to explain in detail but I only had 45 seconds. Okay, JD. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and I'm sure he's doing a great job telling you that all anyway, so. Yeah, I have a question about the rapture. Yes, sir. You know, there are many churches. The Catholic Church is the largest church in the world, I, I believe, but there are Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and a lot of people here have friends that are, you know, with other religions, or I mean churches, mm -hmm. then Calvary Chapel, like United Church of Christ, and they've, a lot of church are getting to be very liberal and make changes. Yes. And I don't know, um, the, since the Catholics are the largest, uh, that means more of them are going well, that's, to the, that, that's uh, a good question. Maybe largest chrono, uh, numerically, but you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, um, they have the truth. There are, you know, I don't know what the latest figure is, the number of people who claim to be Roman Catholics. There are 300 million Eastern Orthodox Christians in the world also, too. I don't know what the latest Protestant figures are. But you're right. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of people out there that claim to believe in Jesus, all right? And they have distinctive beliefs about Jesus. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestantism all believe in the, the, the Apostles' Creed. They believe Jesus uh, is God the Son, second person of the Trinity. They believe he died for the sins of the world, was buried, and rose from the dead. That, they do have that, that core belief. Beyond that, though, there are, there are differences, and they want to play those down. However, other groups deny that. The Mormon Church you mentioned, they do not believe in Jesus Christ being God the Son, second person of the Trinity. They, do, they believe that actually Mormon males can become gods and the, and the God of this world was once a human being and who, be, who worked himself up to be God and, and Mormon males can become God and, you know, and, and people their own planets and their own uh, part of the solar system. So they have a different view of God than the, the historic Christian view and uh, that's why we call them a non-Christian cult because they deviate from the historic Christian position. Now here's the thing, and, and, and here's where we really got to rely on God's goodness here. If someone really truly believes in Jesus and they have that relationship with him, and they may be untaught in a lot of different areas, that's not going to stop them from getting into the kingdom of God. Now, they're pro they need to be taught better, they need to, but if they know Jesus, they know Jesus. Now, the ones that know Jesus, God is the only one with the scorecard there. You and I don't have it. We don't know. And I don't know. I don't even pretend to know if someone's in or someone's out. I know this, though. If they reject the historic Jesus, the real Jesus, they're out. However, even if they have the name Christian Church and, you know, they walk in the doors, they have to have that personal faith in Christ. And again, who, know, who of us knows their heart? Thank God he's going to judge someday. But you're right. There's an awful lot of people out there claiming to be that. And who's actually going to go up in the rapture? Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised. Now, wait a minute. There was no rapture. And then they go up in it. So I think uh, we'll wait and see. Meet those people on the way up, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, will, I was tell them. You'll find out sooner or later. Bombay. <laughs> um, I, we're going to take a couple more, but I'm saving a really good one for last. So, uh, <laughs> okay. No, it'll be the the icing on the cake, the okay. bow on the. Yeah, we'll come over here, and then we'll, we'll go over here. And you're a very patient crowd, by the way. Appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> okay, I have a not so good question, but that's okay. Anyway. <laughs> I got a not so uh, good answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to know when you're studying the Bible in general. How do you know when to read it literally or when it's symbolic? Uh, excellent. That's a great question, actually. That's one of the best questions of the night, so you shouldn't apologize. Very simple rule of Bible interpretation, all right? I'll go slow, because sometimes I'm accused of talking too fast. I don't know why people think that. All right. <clears throat> if the literal sense makes good sense, then seek no other sense, lest you come up with nonsense, okay? <laughs> In other words, if you can take it at face value, do it. You know, God has given us a written communication of himself, and if you can take it literally and it makes good sense, then, then stick with that. Um, 
in any communication, when we communicate one to another, we understand when we're not speaking literally. There are idiomatic expressions. They have that in both testaments. We use that, you know, um, here in, you know, in Hawaii. We have it in the mainland. We use it around the world. We know we're not talking literally. It's raining cats and dogs. We don't expect Fifi and Fido coming down from the sky, do we? We know it's raining heavily, something like that. So we use expressions like that to, to, um, that are symbolic of something else. But here's something real important. I'm glad you asked that. Whenever someone says, well, that's symbolic, you always have to ask this question, well, okay, symbolic of what? Because behind every symbol, there's something literal there. If something is symbolic of something, it's symbolic of something. And what is it symbolic of? And the trouble is when people say, well, the Bible's symbolic and all these things, well, okay, fine. But what is it symbolic of? And the problem is many people who say that cannot come to any near consensus of what it's symbolic of when it's saying something. God expected the people at Jesus' time to accept him from whom he claimed to be because he literally fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament, the predictions. And um, if we're going to make a mistake, let's take God at his word and maybe make it on the literal side rather than, than make it on the other side. That's the way I look at it. All right, you got your fi next to the final question here? Oh. All right. If the Ten Commandments um, have not changed, I have a question. If we are considered the bride of Christ and Christ has gone to prepare a place for us and to return for his bride, so the question is, if we do not follow the fourth commandment, are we breaking the covenant, the marriage covenant with, um, with God? Okay, good question. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Nine out of the ten commandments are repeated in one form or another in the New Testament. The only one that is not repeated for the New Testament church, the Bride of Christ, is the fourth commandment. And to the contrary, we are told not to keep the Sabbath. We are told that in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, that, you know, uh, with respect to new moons and holy days and the such like, let no one judge you with respect to that, because those are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. The Sabbath was given, according to Exodus 31, to the nation Israel as an everlasting covenant between them and God. Um, Jesus, as an observant Jew, kept the Sabbath, but he rose from the dead the first day of the week, and the Christian church has decided to recognize that, and the early church met on the first day of the week to recognize the new work going on. Now, if people want to worship on the Sabbath, no problem, that's fine. They want to have church on Thursday, that's fine. But we're not under the Sabbatarian laws now. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, we see three different places in the New Testament where we're not to keep the Sabbath, or, or the church met on Sunday, the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it was on a Sunday night. Remember Paul gave one of those JD sermons where the guy fell asleep from the top floor? <laughs> And, and drop dead. I don't know if that's happened to you. But, uh, but that was on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they had it. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 2, same thing. On the first day of the week, as we deal with all the churches, take up the collection there and, you know, collect the money to give, and we'll take it, the collection on the first day, because they met the first day of the week, Sunday. And the early church recognized Sunday was the day of, the, of representing Christ's resurrection. Also, Revelation 1, 10 is an interesting one where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, many people take that uh, adjective there, kuriakos in the Greek, to mean uh, he, the day of the Lord, the prophetic period called the day of the Lord. However, that's the modern term for Sunday. And it could very well be John said, I was there on Sunday worshiping when the Lord spoke to that. And so that's, that's possible in Revelation 1.10. And so, bottom line. Exodus 31 makes it very clear the Sabbath day is a real, you know, was a relationship God gave with Israel. When Christ rose the first day of the week, the early church decided to recognize that and to separate itself from Judaism and, and, and worship on another day, breaking this with the Sabbath tradition. And for a Jew to do that, they, had to be some, they really had to believe what they're doing, something very special. So, to answer your question, no, as the bride of Christ, we worship him. We don't limit it. What's today? Thursday? You know, every day of the week, um, like, uh, like uh, Pastor Chuck says, now I know what David meant when he said, I'll, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, it seems, because we seem to be there every night doing something. But no, we, we, we worship the Lord. Uh, we just set aside Sunday as the day we meet as Christians to recognize a new work done by the Lord, that he came back from the dead the first day of the week. The early church did that. Um, but if people want to meet on Saturday, um, more power to them. There's no, no problem with that. We don't have to meet the, the, uh, on, on the Sabbath or Saturday or Sunday, but that's the day we've chosen to do that because the Lord set down that pattern. But, you know, it's fine whatever day we want to meet. 
Okay, we got the last question. Last question. Is this the one you're going to, the, the final one here? Oh, no, it's a good one. Okay. I mean, they're all good, but. Yes, they're really all very good, good actually. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what does it mean to be born again? How does one know? Uh, is it a feeling? What are the requirements? Excellent one to end with. Okay. Born again means to be born spiritually, born from above. When you were born physically, you were born separated from God. We need a spiritual rebirth. How do we become born again? Very simple. Say to the Lord Jesus, you know, uh, if you, I understand that you died for me. Uh, and the best way I know how, I trust you as Savior and Lord. I, I, tr I trust you that you died in my place so I can know you. Is there a feeling associated with it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, not necessarily. Maybe some people have very dramatic conversions. Others just believe that they're changed. Uh, the good news is tonight, the message is for there, every one of us. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can walk out of this room born again, knowing you're going to heaven, knowing you have your sins forgiven, knowing you can have eternal life, having that spiritual rebirth, because without it, you can't see the kingdom of God. We're born separated from God physically, but we're dead spiritually or separated. If we die in that state, we will be separated eternally from God. But if we trust Christ as Savior, we will live forever with him by being born again or born from above. That is the message we preach. That's what you hear from J.D. all the time. That's the message in this book, and that's what we believe. J.D., wrap it up. Thank you, Don. Let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we're just in awe of you. <laughs> the English language is inadequate to express to you our love for you, our thanks to you. Lord, we have all eternity to worship you for what you've done for us. Lord, for anyone here tonight who does not have a personal saving relationship with you, I pray that this would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray that you will not let them leave here the same way they came here, that you would embolden them to ask for prayer, that we might share with them and pray for them to receive you as their Lord and Savior, so like John, they can know that they have eternal life. Lord, thank you. We love you so much. Lord, bless the food we're going to partake of tonight. Bless it to our bodies. Bless the conversation that will continue. Bless the questions that will continue. And Lord, we cannot thank you enough for your goodness, for your grace, for dying for us, for paying in full for us, for all of our sins, so we could have all of eternity to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.